Hey guys, Walt Bayless here. I just wanted to say hi and uh, share with you, well, I'm in my studio right now. This is where I um, do a lot of writing and painting. I've got uh, watercolor stuff over there I'll show you later on. But uh, what I wanted to share with you today was my new book, uh, Night Vision. So this bad boy here, it's a fun read. It's a cool adventure. I think it's about 430 pages. So even if it's not your favorite story, you uh, could probably get a confession I think maybe with it, but uh, no, I think I think you really will like the story. I, I hope so anyway. And uh, instead of just taking my word for it, I thought I'd uh, take a little time and uh, read you a couple of chapters here and there, and see if you uh, see if you dug it. But uh, anyway, um, I write the way I write, so don't bother with constructive criticism. But if you love it, please run out and grab the book. Uh, it means the world, and I'm trying to make some big changes in mine. So this is the first of a uh, of a series that's coming. So. I won't bother getting you all set up with what's happening. You can read the synopsis online. But anyway, let me grab my uh, spectacles here. Okay, here we go. Night Vision. All right, this is uh, a Sam Blackwell novel. This is book one. Chapter one. Something bad was coming. He could feel it in his gut. Earl Blanchard had been a security guard for years, and he liked everything about the job. The uniform, the responsibility... The odd hours, helping people. He even liked that big hat he got to wear sometimes when he worked the mall. Ever since he was a kid, Earl wanted to be a cop of some kind. But he was born with a bum left hip and, as Earl had to admit, couldn't run for shit. But Earl could walk his rounds all night long and stay alert while doing it. He was never late and he never fell asleep on a shift, not like a lot of the other guards did. He was sharp, honest, and licensed to carry a sidearm. And for this latest job, all of that was required. Alistair's Jewelry was a big chain store that paid well and took care of their employees long term. Everybody in security wanted in. But Earl turned 56 last January and he had really needed this gig. The stability, the extra money, it wasn't easy. But with a solid work history and good references, it was no surprise that Earl finally landed the position. He had been with Alistair's three weeks already and Earl was thrilled. Or at least he should have been. But, staring at the, but starting at the beginning of his shift one evening, Earl began to feel a kind of terrible dread brewing down inside him. Deep down, he wanted to pretend he wasn't feeling well and just go home. But he was the new guy, and he couldn't just take time off like that. So instead, Earl Blanchard began walking his rounds, trying hard not to think about that dreadful feeling, the one, uh, the one that told him something bad was going to happen, and that it was going to happen tonight. As he, strode, as he strode along, Earl forced himself uh, to think about other things, glancing around at the lavish environment. The store itself was a beautiful place, and there were plenty of things around to catch and keep the eye. Alistair's was designed and laid out like a big art gallery, slick, glass showcases high and low. All of them lit up with little spotlights and set into, dazzle, set into a dazzling maze for the herds of buyers to get lost into. It was a brilliant plan, and it worked. Another reason Alistair's jewelry was so successful was that a hell of a lot of people got married at young out there in Utah. All of those weddings were, of course, excellent for business. The store, uh, the store had their strategy worked out to the last detail, and Earl had watched it go down a thousand times. All those pent-up young missionaries would come back after a two-year stretch, and they couldn't wait to get married. They were what Mr. Alistair called highly motivated buyers. And boy, were they ever, thought Earl. Earl had seen the salespeople there upgrade kids into rings that cost damn near as much as his car. But these kids were so horny they were about to pop, dying to get laid in the only way the church said was legal. By the time they got to, uh, to the jewelry store, they were ready to do just about anything to scratch that unrelenting satanic itch. <laughs> of course, Alistair's salespeople knew that all too well. Hell, half of them were members of the church themselves. They would always joke and say, the nicer the ring, the nicer the honeymoon, wink, wink. And the poor kids usually fell for it. But Earl had been around the block a few times, and he knew that all that talk about fine jewelry and making things work was bullshit. His wife, Dottie, was a great lady, and she didn't give a crap about pearls or diamonds at all. The good ones were out there, thought Earl. You just had to be patient in order to find them. But he kept his mouth shut and didn't warn any of the young people who were shopping there, even though he sometimes wanted to. Instead, Earl Blanchard just nodded and smiled at the customers when they came in, and the owner liked that. How we doing tonight, Earl, said Mr. Alistair, walking by on his way to the control room. 
It was closing time and the boss man had to go shut down all the fancy spotlights and overheads, make sure everything was ready for lockup. In a few minutes, uh, there would only be the dim glow of the security lighting they had in place. In truth, those lights weren't really that dim at all. In fact, they were so pleasantly illuminating that half the time Earl didn't carry his flashlight. But after the blazing heavenly glow of the open storefront, it took a little time for his eyes to finally adjust. But by around midnight or so, that place would be almost as comfortable as his own living room. Which was damn nice for a change. In the past, Earl had worked places where they just left him in the dark all night long, or maybe stuck him alone in a corner somewhere, just sitting on his ass. That can really get to you after a while. But this place, thought Earl, this place was a dream. There was all that pretty scenery, of course, all that fancy jewelry sparkling around, uh, sparkling around him under glass. Posters of beautiful women smiling seductively as he walked his rounds. Nice furniture to rest on if he got tired. Nice everything, really. The owner called it uh, the spirit of opulence, and Earl understood. Mr. Allister wanted people to feel wealthy, even if they didn't have very much. And it was something he wanted for both his customers and his employees. So he did little things like keep the store at a cozy temperature overnight. That was definitely a first. Some stores allowed the place to turn into a goddamn icebox after hours, let the night guard freeze to death with only a cup of coffee and a cheap space heater to keep him warm. But not Alistair's. The owner kept a little heat going in the winter and some AC flowing during the hottest months of the year. All just for him. And then, of course, there was Earl's favorite perk of the job. The big break room stocked with all kinds of tasty snacks and sodas in case he got hungry. Everything was free so long as he didn't overdo it. Plenty to be happy about, thought Earl again, checking his watch. But the man didn't feel very happy at all. That, the awful dread that was nagging him earlier was still twisting inside his stomach. And deep down he knew it was something that he couldn't ignore. The fact was that Earl had gotten bad feelings like this before, and almost every time something bad had actually happened. One time it was a thief that tried to break in during the middle of his shift. The guy was out of his mind on drugs and dangerous as hell. Another time a vicious gang started vandalizing the place with, uh, with crowbars and bricks. Pretty scary stuff if you're stuck inside someplace all alone. And every time that bad feeling had tried to warn him. Maybe it was some kind of ESP, like his wife said and he should listen to it. But Earl always just ignored the feeling and stuck out his shift, telling himself that it was the right thing to do. Each time, though, the danger kept getting closer. In fact, the last time Earl got a bad feeling, some lunatic tried to set the whole warehouse on fire while he was still inside. Smoke everywhere. That was a close one, thought Earl. Too close. But those stores weren't like Alistair's, Earl kept telling himself. This place was, wasn't some flimsy warehouse. This place was prime. He glanced up at the army of security cameras watching over him from above, scanning every inch of the place with digital perfection. One red flag and the security company called the cops. On top of that, everything was reinforced and nearly, nearly impossible to penetrate after full lockdown. So what the hell was he so worried about? Earl's stomach churned and he checked his watch again. It was a little after 9.30 when Earl heard the switches in the control room start to fall. The bright overhead lights began fading out one row at a time, and then, that little dis and then the little display lights blinked out quietly after that. A few moments later, Mr. Alistair appeared, waving goodnight. Earl waved back and watched as the owner headed out, pushing his way through the first set of reinforced glass doors. He turned to lock them, but all of a sudden, the power to the whole store went out. Everything pitch black in an instant. Earl crouched a little in surprise. Mr. Alistair, he called out. I think maybe a transformer's down. He searched his body for his flashlight, but the, one, but the one time he'd actually needed it in that place, Earl had left it in the break room. A bad new habit that came back to bite him that night. Mr. Alistair? Nobody answered. In the darkness, Earl heard a struggle, people grunting and somebody getting hit over and over again. It sounded awful. Then it was quiet once more. Sir, are you, are, sir, are, you, are, are you all right? Silence. Earl's heart began pounding out of his chest as he stood there trembling in the blackness. Mr. Alistair, he cried out one last time. But he knew damn well that his boss was down somewhere, injured or maybe even dead. Instinctively, Earl reached back and drew his gun. Almost immediately, his pulse began to race, blood rushing through his ears and deafening him along with his blindness. 
But after a few horrible moments, Earl began to hear again, whispering voices hissing to each other as they raced around freely in the dark. Earl's wide, blind eyes tried to follow the whispers as he jerked his head and his pistol this way and that. Suddenly, a few dull backup security lights began to flicker on, but almost immediately, a shadowy figure jumped up and smashed the bulbs with a weapon of some kind. First one, then another. Pretty soon, whoever they were had gotten them all, and then it was pitch black all over again. "'Who's there?' cried Earl, his hand shaking. Nobody answered him. There were only those eerie whispers again, figures and voices darting around in the blackness with unhindered speed. Nobody bumping or running into anything, thought Earl. This place was a maze, and it was dark, and... At once, the sound of shattering glass erupted all around him. Earl jumped. The police are on their way, he shouted, wide eyes still searching helplessly in the black. I'm warning you, I have a gun. Now why don't you all get the hell out of here while you still can? Earl tried to sound as brave as he could, hoping like hell those thugs would just run away. But it didn't work at all. And the whispers and the breaking glass went on and on. Earl's hands were still shaking as he reached into his pocket for his cell phone. But all of a sudden, he saw something, something that made him freeze. And in that moment, Earl was struck on the head from behind, and his body went crumbling to the floor. There was only more darkness after that. The next day, Earl Blanchard would tell police that he couldn't remember much of anything about that night. It was pitch black in there, and he hadn't seen a thing. Of course... The truth was that he had seen something, but it was only for a second, and it was bizarre. Probably nobody would even believe him if he mentioned it anyway. So Earl left out the part about the eyes. All right, that's chapter one. I'm not sure how long this video is going. I'm going to bore you to tears. But uh, all right, I'm going to assume that you said, uh, hey, Walt, why don't you read us one more? <laughs> okay, we'll check it out because then we get into the main character. All right, I hope you're having a good time. I will bust out one more chapter here for you. I don't know how long this baby is. All right, let's give it a shot. Okay, chapter two. I could feel the cold, artificial air blowing across my face, but in my mind there was only the desert. The vision came to me again shortly after I'd been seated for my flight. It all started with a call from a woman named Carol Mosley. She said that her daughter was missing and, and needed my help, and she needed my help. The kid's name was Catherine, but everybody called her Cat. I say kid, but in fact, Cat Mosley was 19 and enrolled in college. Cat was blonde, pretty, and athletic. Apparently, she disappeared one evening after a night out with her friends. That was almost three months ago. The authorities, as they like to call themselves, hadn't been able to turn up anything so far. Naturally, Carol was desperate. And desperate is exactly how most people are by the time they reach out to a psychic investigator for help. I get thousands of requests every year, but I only really look into a handful of them. I know from experience that I won't be able to do my best work unless a case jumps out at me in some way. The Mosley case j did just that. And so I called Carol back right away. I began with a short conversation, and then I had her overnight me an article of cat's clothing, preferably unwashed. The next day, I got a red cotton shirt sealed in a plastic bag. I opened the package and let the shirt fall into my hands. The unsettling desert scene flashed into my mind. I, carled, I, I called Carol back and described part of my vision. It must have hit the spot. The next day, I had a first-class plane ticket waiting for me at the San Diego International Airport. Round trip to Salt Lake City, Utah. So there I was on the plane, sitting in my seat with that red t-shirt still in my hands. At the moment, uh, I was lost once more into the vision it kept showing me. The open desert the high blowing dunes, and then someone screaming for Cat to run. Can I get you something? My eyes flashed open and I saw the flight attendant standing there with a drink cart. She wore a bright, kind smile that seemed genuine. Her name tag said Ellen. I checked my cell phone for the time, pretending for a few seconds to deliberate about having a drink so early. But honestly, my head was pounding from the vision and I was eager to take off the edge. I let the t-shirt fall into the empty seat beside me and nodded. Bloody Mary, I said, if it isn't too much trouble. Not at all, said Ellen. She leaned in and whispered, and since it's your birthday, I'm going to make it a double. I glanced around the plane and then back at the short-haired redhead making my drink. May I ask how you know that, I said, uh, that it's my birthday? I hope you won't be too upset, said Ellen. I just recognized you from that TV show you did. 
Finder, right? You watched Finder, I said? How'd you like it? Are you kidding, said Ellen? I loved it. Do you think there might be another season? I kind of doubt it, I said. Maybe another book if I can find the time, but work's keeping me pretty busy at the moment. Well, I'll be sure to read it if you do, said Ellen. A soft hand came up for me to shake as the young woman formally introduced herself. Sam Blackwell, I said, taking her hand. But I guess you already knew that. You're not angry, are you? No, I said, I'm just a little tired. You buzzed all your hair off since your last show, she said. It's a good look on you. It was more about simplicity than looks, I said, but thank you, I appreciate that. Ellen lowered her voice. Listen, she said, leaning in to place my drink. I know you like your privacy, but if you need anything at all, just let me know, okay? She tapped a bright red fingernail on the cocktail napkin and smiled. That's very kind of you, I said. And if you wouldn't mind, Ellen was already making a zipping and locking motion over her lips, and then she threw the key away. Thank you, I said. And then Ellen left. Suddenly, there was an old woman in my view, staring at me from uh, her seat across the aisle. Her head was turned sharply in my direction, dressed in black, like for a funeral, and then her eyes turned black as well. She bared her teeth at me, and I watched them go sharp, from human to reptile in an instant. Her human flesh rippled away for a moment, revealing the scaly truth underneath. It was something that only I could see, and the old woman knew it. Quickly, she turned away and stood up into the aisle. I heard her ask one of the attendants if she could be seated somewhere else for the remainder of the flight. Fine with me, I thought. Lechens gave me the creeps anyway. I sat, on, I sat alone on my side of the plane for the next two hours in relative silence, just the way I liked it. Um, several times I glanced over at the red t-shirt in the empty seat beside me, but I left it alone for now, not wanting to make a not wanting to make contact again until I was on solid ground. Something that had happened to Cat, something had happened to Cat Mosley, something bad. But that wasn't what I wanted to say to her poor mother, the, poor mother the first time we met. So instead I drifted back into my memory of the vision and pondered the place for details. The desert, the high blowing dunes, the tall red rocks where I saw the place where she and one of her friends had carved their names. Best friends, I said putting down my china cup of coffee onto its tiny white saucer. It was three hours later, and I was seated across from Carol Mosley at last. Unfortunately, her father was there, too. Let's see. Okay, her father was there, too. The three of us gathered at the center of a very ornate and oversized living room. I studied Carol from where I sat. She was, beautiful, but aus she was a beautiful but austere-looking woman, dyed blonde hair pulled back into a decorative bun. Elegant, certainly but with hard, unhappy edges underneath. Pain and regret had etched themselves into her features over the years. But, as I described the desert vision out loud, Carol Mosley's face began blossoming into a smile. Tears filled her eyes, and a bright new hope filled her heart. Oh my God, she cried. That's Red Rock City, the Red Canyon Dunes. It's that place exactly. I don't believe it. Oh, Daddy, I think maybe he really can help us find Cat. Now wait just a doggone minute, the old man snapped. Franklin Mosley. Franklin fucking Mosley. Carol's father was a smallish man with the same sharp features she had, only miniaturized. He was wearing a nice suit and a sour expression, an aggressive, disapproving look I knew he'd probably practiced a million times on anybody that would let him. It was obvious that Franklin was used to intimidating people, manipulating them with his power and his wealth. He scooted forward on the edge of his chair and clapped his little hands together. I don't know what kind of a scam you're running here, Mr. Blackwell, but I don't appreciate you coming into my home and filling my daughter's head with false hope, especially not with this half-baked magic act of yours. I sighed and leaned back into the couch, meeting the old bully's eyes for a while. He probably hated everything about me. He was a short, scrawny businessman, and I was a tall ex-wrestler in jeans and a button-down. And on top of all that, I was supposed to be a psychic or something. We were on opposite sides of the universe, and probably everything about me rubbed him the wrong way. But the thing he hated about me most was the fact that his daughter was reaching out to me for assistance instead of him. This was one problem the old man couldn't solve with bluster or money, and Franklin hated me for it. He was still glaring at me when his daughter cleared her throat. <clears throat> Please, Daddy, Carol began, let's give him a, a chance. I mean, how could he know so much about Catherine already, where she's been, even about her best friend? He's a con man, Franklin spat, getting to his feet. 
It's what they do. He glared at me some more. Now I promised Carol that I would indulge her this little meeting or whatever you want to call it. So here I am. But I won't stand idly by while you try to swindle her out of a fortune under my own roof. I looked up in the direction of the roof he was talking about and then back down at Franklin. My eyes settled on Carol then. I thought this was your house, I said. Carol blushed. Well, it is, but... But your father bought it for you, I finished. The old man was shocked, and I closed my eyes to get some more. I saw the flowers, Carol in a long white dress. A wedding present, I went on. And I could see that Gary or Gerald... Gerald is Kat's father, she said. Anybody could look that up, the old man barked. It's public record, for God's sake. And then in my mind I saw Franklin yelling at poor Gerald, demeaning him right in front of his wife and daughter. I got the feeling he did that all the time. No wonder the guy ran off with the lady from the grocery store. He would never have been the man of this house, at least not as long as Franklin was alive. I opened my eyes just as the old man returned to his rant. I've paid the state's top, I've paid the state's top investigators to find our cat, he shouted. And let's not forget the work of half dozen police detectives and the FBI. Now I'm supposed to stand here and believe that you're going to waltz in and save the day? And for one hell of a fee, no doubt. Well, I'm no fool, Mr. Blackwell. I want, I want you out of my house this instant. But Daddy, not another word. Out! Let me sit up here. Sorry, guys. He's pissed. Franklin's pissed. The room was still ringing from the old man shouting, ringing for a good 30 seconds after he was done. But in the end, I was still sitting there calmly on the couch. Did you hear me, mister, or do I have to call the police? Carol, I said, would you mind giving the two of us a minute alone? I need to speak with your father in private. I have nothing more to say to you, Mr. Blackwell. But I have something I'd like to say to you, I said. Carol? Carol was flustered, but she nodded at last and then slowly edged away. I waited until she was out of earshot before I smiled at the grumpy old man again. Sit down, Franklin, I said. You've got to give yourself a stroke acting like that. Now listen here, you two-bit. Sit down, I said again, a little louder this time. It was the one tone I knew this old windbag wasn't used to hearing. But then I softened again. I'm going to make you a deal. A deal, Franklin scoffed. What the hell kind of a deal do you think you can make with me? There's nothing on God's green earth that you can offer me, sir. And there damn sure isn't you have another daughter, don't you? I most certainly do not, Franklin growled. Carol is my only Lisa, I said, trying to get the picture to come clear. Or Elisa, is that right? Wait, it is Elisa. She'll be 20 this year. In an instant, Franklin's lips snapped shut and his face went red. I knew that look well. It was the look people always got when they suddenly realized two things. One, that I wasn't a fake after all. And two, that they had at least one really dirty secret that was right out in the open now, at least to me. So we just sat there for a while and let the reality of, all, uh, reality of it all sink in, of all that sink in. After a minute or so had passed, I leaned in and spoke quietly. Listen, I said, I don't take on every case that lands in my lap, but I've got a feeling that I can help here. And yes, there will be a fee. I have expenses. I'm sure you can understand that. All I'm asking is that you, don't stop, is that you stop trying to get in my way. I have enough interference to deal with as it is. Now, if you'll just let me do my job, I will do my best to help you with that, that other thing. No charge, okay? And in the meantime, your secret is safe with me, I promise. You promise, scoffed Franklin. Yes, I promise. The old, man, the old man's face was still red, but he didn't say another word after that, at least not to me. He just buttoned his suit and then stormed, out, uh, then, and then stormed straight out of the living room in a huff. I could hear him grumbling at his daughter on the way out of the front door. Something about how she could do whatever the hell she wanted to and that he wasn't going to be party to it. The front door slammed and Carol came walking tentatively back into the living room. She gestured back the way she'd came. I've never seen him like that. I I've never seen him like that, she said. What did you say to him? It was personal, I said. Nothing bad, I promise. Just personal. All right, said Carol, slowly sitting down again. Personal, fine. So what do we do now? If you're ready to get started, I said, I'll need half an advance and the name of Kat's best friend, where she lives and all that. Something with an S, am I right? Stephanie, Carol said. She got out her checkbook and began writing. Stephanie Holt. She lives a few miles north of here. I'll need her phone number, I said. In fact, I'll need contact information for anybody else you can think of that was close to Kat. 
Of course, said Carol. I can get all that for you. She tore out the check and handed, to me, handed it to me, watching me look it over. Is that right? It is, I said, folding it into my pocket. I stood up from the prissy couch in my tiny cup of decaf. Do you mind if I have a look around Kat's room while you find those numbers? Not at all, said Carol. It's right this way. I followed the tall blonde woman back into the southern half of her very large house. It was then that I first heard the faint scratching sounds coming from somewhere up ahead. And then the pungent smell of sulfur began wafting through the air. All right, guys, that's the end of chapter two. Uh, let me know if you'd like to hear some more. I'll read some more later to you. And if you liked what you heard, it would mean the world to me if you popped on Amazon. I'll uh, leave a link somewhere down here. Um, I'm not a member of any kind of special uh, political group. This is just my hand for Cintiq painting. Anyway, um, yeah, pick it up off Amazon. I've got it in print. I've got it on the Kindle. And if you love it, which I, de I, de I deeply hope you do, uh, please give it five stars. And um, if not, don't bother. <laughs> Four stars actually kicks my butt. So uh, anyway, it would help a ton. And uh, let me know if you enjoyed yourself. I'll read some more. But thank you very much for spending some time here. And if you already got the book, thank you deeply in advance also. So anyway, uh, I will talk to you guys later on. Take care and have a magical rest of your day.